Welcome to Under the Covers, where we talk to your favorite YouTube drummers and get behind the scenes of their covers and their channels. Before we dive in, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel using these buttons below and do the same thing for our featured drummer. You'll find links for the channels and videos and anything else we discuss in the description. Let's get started. Welcome to Under the Covers. We're sitting here with Earl Bennett. Please like and subscribe to Earl's channel. Any of the drummers that we talk about or videos that we discuss will be in the description below. And please like and subscribe. I gotta tell you, man, I'm a fan. Um, I uh, I went through your series, and you've got hundreds or thousands of videos. I obviously generally tend to lean towards the actual covers. You're extremely talented, man. Extremely talented. Well, thanks for the kind words. I appreciate that. I think that our musical tastes, you go back a little further than I do, but when I was growing up, my mother always played her music. So, so I've got a really diverse and really eclectic musical collection. But as I was going through yours, there's some really killer stuff in there. Well, thank you. I, you know, I like a lot of the stuff that makes me happy. And I've played a lot of different styles of music. It's not I'm not like a one trick guy. Like I only play jazz rock because I love Chicago so much. It's been a career of playing lots of different gigs, doing lots of different things. I, when I was in my teens, I was in rock bands. In my twenties, I did club dates and weddings and to make money and pay the bills for my family. Um, by the end of my twenties, I was in a band trying to make a record in, in Christian music. I did that. And not much success, but I got the experience of playing in a Nashville studio and getting replaced by a Nashville drummer. Uh, that was kind of interesting, you know. And then it became my lifelong thing to have my own recording studio and record music. So that's been my journey pretty much. And for the last 20 plus years, I've had a recording studio. And YouTube came in around 2017 when I was in a job transition and my wife said to me, she saw one of those videos by Terry Keating. I don't know if you know Terry Keating, Bonzolium. He's one of the guys that loves John Bonham. Um, and Terry Keating used to do lots of cymbal videos. And I was watching him about Peisty cymbals. I bought a Peisty 505 Crash. And she heard me listening to him just rant on about Peisty cymbals. And she, she said to me, she goes, you know, you could do that. So she's the one who encouraged me to do it. I had plenty of time to just make drum covers, and I started goofing around with it. And then one day, Drum Man 190 found me. He finds everybody, it seems like, and invited me to do some collaborations. And I won Drum Cover of the Year in 2017. I won it over a bunch of great drummers. They're all friends of mine, like Jeff Holden, The Music Room, and Beats by Jay. Which cover? Carry On My Wayward Son by Kansas. Tell me about you, you know, where you're from. I'm from New Jersey. I live in South Florida. I moved here about 20 years ago. 
you know, study music in college. You got a BA from Jersey City State College, which is now New Jersey City University. I got married at 22 um, to my beautiful wife of 38 years right now. We're more in love today than ever. We have three kids and I have 10 grandkids. And all of a sudden I was in this, got to make, earn money, got to make money. Gigging became a way to make money. So I started playing a lot of weddings. And then my wife was a singer in our church and she, she wanted to get in the act. So I always kid her. I go, Lucy wanted to be in the show. So I built a band around my wife and we had some really fun times in the eighties doing that. And somewhere in the middle of that, my wife also started writing for Modern Drummer Magazine. She's a, a writer, an author. She's actually published five books, but she was writing for newspapers and Modern Drummer Magazine back in the 80s and the 90s. I got to meet some of my heroes because she got to interview some of my heroes. So that was kind of fun. Drumming has been just something I've always done, but it couldn't, didn't pay the bills. So I worked in the cable industry for about 35 years. But the music never stopped. I always had gigs, always playing weddings, always doing clubs with somebody. When I moved to Florida, um, my goal was to do my wife's album. That's why I started a, a studio. And her album available on my YouTube channel. If you go there, you'll see Stephanie Bennett uh, toward the land. I'm going to start with a studio because that was for a long time a dream of mine was to have my own. And the amount of money you have to throw into that is crazy. Is your studio like a, a working studio or is it just yours? It has been a working studio over the years, but I realized I couldn't make any money in the digital age. But for me, running a commercial studio didn't make any sense because I couldn't make any money at it. I've done some interesting projects. I've done like three bluegrass albums. So I've, you know, and I, and I would make money for these projects. The, those, were the, those were the ones that would buy my next computer, you know, or buy me a snare drum or buy me some preamps for my studio. The audio engineering side, I realized if I wanted to play on other people's records, I needed to learn how to do that. Yeah. And if I wanted to record my wife's album and not spend zillions of dollars in somebody's studio at 40 bucks an hour or something. Because mm -hmm. I've, I've played in Nashville. I've played in New York City. I've been mm -hmm. in real with Neve consoles and that kind of stuff, you know. Okay. And then you're spending dollars. I, I couldn't afford that. I've been in the local little guy's studio in towns. And I decided I would be a local little guy. And it just was right at the cusp of the end of the ADAT era into the computer era when I started. I, so I had 16 tracks of ADATs, which was really harsh sounding and really didn't sound good unless you had a lot of outboard gear. And then the Macintosh computer changed everything for me. And that's hmm. how I was able to And then having a couple friends that were audio engineers taught me how to mix and what, what to do to get the sound how to mess with it. And I, I think any DAW you can get a decent drum sound in. Is your space like attached to your house? I've got a detached garage. Uh -huh. We bought us with the intention of putting the studio in the car, three car garage. So how many, how many rooms and I guess more, cause I'm interested, how many drum sets do you actually have set up like right now? Right now I have two drum kits. This is my main room. Right out there is the computer probably, you see that. And then as you go around, You'll see other stuff through the room. You can see the the concert tom kit I have uh -huh. set up. Tell me about the concert kit first. The concert tom kit is an old pearl from the seventies fiberglass kit. I bought the kit from a guy that made custom drums, and he has, actually has built me two custom snare drums. His name was Dan Ratelli, DMR Custom Drums, and then I got them home, and they were all ripped up. The covering was all ripped up. And Pearl didn't really spend a lot of time gluing things down really strongly. So the covers just ripped off. So I left them fiberglass. And then I realized that's what Hal Blaine did, the famous studio drummer from the 60s. Mm -hmm. He had a whole kit of concert toms with Blame Air shells that were just fiberglass. And I thought it looked kind of cool. So I kind of kept them that way. I, I noticed on your videos when I was watching, there's no resonant heads. That's the way they came. That, that was the sound of the 70s. Mm -hmm. started to see it in the 60s they started taking the bottom heads off of drum kits like um Ringo's kit in the latest Beatle thing the floor tom doesn't have a bottom head the two top toms you know 12 and 13 have bottom heads uh the guy for the doors John Densmore he had a, a kit with a 12 and a 14 by 14 floor tom and they had no bottom heads no front head so it was becoming the thing to do was to take the bottom heads off 
And this guy, Hal Blaine, who was the studio drummer of the, the Wrecking Crew, the famous Wrecking Crew, who played on the Beach Boys and the Carpenters and the Association and the Captain and Tennille. And he was the guy that made these things famous because he put a whole kit of drums together with his technician, his drum He was the first guy to have a drum and he basically set up seven concert toms. And then Ludwig stole the design and started making them. And then Ludwig had a kit, Pearl had a kit, Slingerland had a kit, and it was by design, no bottom hits. So when you are doing drum covers, do you, is there a specific era or type of music or whatever that you go to that kit for? Definitely. I use it for a lot of 60s music, some of the 70s music, and early 80s music, you know. Like, if I was going to try a Rush cover, I would definitely have some of those drums on the kit. Okay, so tell me about the Gretsch kit. The Gretsch kit is a 1979 uh, Gretsch kit I bought in college. Um, I sold my Blue Vista Light. I had one of those. My first drum kit was a Ludwig Blue Vista Light kit. And they were great for disco and that rock look thing. But when I went to college to study music, everybody was playing jazz. And it really was kind of not really hip. It was kind of very unhip. So my first summer of college, I worked to buy a drum kit, and this is the kit I bought. And I've never sold it, and it stays here all the time. I've had other drums, but <clears throat> the other drums are all stuff I acquire. You know what I mean? This has been my baby for a long time, and it's just, it's a workhorse. Tell me about the wife's band. Yeah, the band was a wedding band. We, we would go out and play casuals. We used to call them GB gig or casuals or weddings. So we were playing parties, basically. Today, they call them corporate gigs. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, it wasn't so corporate because th it wasn't big bands that had insurance and all the stuff that goes. Back in those days, you threw a band together and you, you know what I mean? If you could get somebody to hire you, you know, you'd work for a hundred bucks a man or whatever it was. So we had our own band. It was called Radiance. And she was the front person. And I kind of did all the, the, the back end lugging of equipment and finding musicians and we played all the, you know, we were like the wedding singer, that movie, The Wedding Singer. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, um, except a little, maybe a little bit better in some respects, and a little bit worse in other respects. You know, there was, there was <laughs> <laughs> by the 90s, running a band became not fun. So then we just did pickup gigs. And I was always doing pickup gigs. I had guys that would call me. I was, I was what they called a ringer. So if somebody couldn't do a gig, they'd call me and say, hey, can you come play? And I became really good at doing that. Which is why I'm, I do drum covers the way I do. Because, like, I, I put out a lot of drum covers, and guys think I do these every day, and I don't. I do them once, I do them on the weekends. The weekends are fun for me. I, make, I can make seven drum covers in a weekend. I just knock them out. I yeah. understand my video, I understand my cameras, I understand editing, and I understand how to play songs quick, fast. I, I boom, 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 you know. And x -Track Stems has made my life wonderful. My channel is really just a uh, recorded practice. And if something's passable, I put it up. You, your playing is really good. I watched a couple of your Fleetwood Mac cover. And, you know, it's when it comes to watching people's covers, if I know the song, it makes it more fun for me to stay in it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If I don't know the song, I'll stay in as long as I can hang. You know what I mean? Or you're inspiring me by your your your, your massive talent. Like yeah. one of the guys I watch on YouTube a lot, who's a friend of mine is Trey B. Yeah, and he's, he's amazing. Yeah, he's amazing. He's a monster. And I will sit there and watch his whole heavy metal his videos. But he is so expressive. He's got such a you know he's in it. And for me, if he's not in it, then I don't I can't stay very long. So I think when you're making covers, putting that expression in it is a huge thing. And if you're a great player like Trey, I can watch it play that stuff, even though that's not my cup of tea. It's not, I'm never gonna do those because I don't do them well enough. And I have too much respect for the guys who do do it. He sounds great too, his sound is, and he wants to record music right, and he wants it to sound right in the track. I'm kind of a snare drum nerd. Really? Like, oh, yeah. I, I, I have about 11 snare drums. Actually, I got a new one coming. So I'm buying a black, I got a Black Beauty 6.5 by 14 coming, Ludwig. Really? But I have a, 
one that I use on everything that's sitting right here. And I've got a Noble Cooley five inch and I've got uh, these couple DMR custom snare drums built for me. One's cast aluminum, the other one's um, a solid shell, walnut shell. It looks like a radio can. And then I've got about five or six other snares that just get thrown in once in a while, like an Acrylite or a Gretsch five inch chrome over brass or a Steve Jordan or Omar Hakim. What I try to do for my videos is I try to switch my kits up all the time. Like certain days, I stay on one kit for a couple days. You know what I mean? But if you were to go through my videos, you would see that that concert tom kit goes from four toms around to six to now seven. Now I have eight of them, so I can do the whole eight kit, eight, eight now. One day you'll see that. The Gretsch kit will go with a four piece. Maybe it'll be a rack and two floor toms or two racks and a floor tom, or I'll put up I have four rack toms for this and two floor toms. I could set them all up, but I don't do it very often. Yeah. I only put what I think fits the song. If it doesn't fit the song, I don't put it there. I have I have 50-something symbols. I don't set up all my symbols. So if it's up there, it means I plan on hitting you. The really interesting thing is I, I, I only watched one, one episode of the Ask Girl thing. But that was one of the things that I found the most interesting about your channel is you know, you, you really took the time to, to explain in depth someone's question and kind of ran it to ground versus just like, you know, hey, here's a question, here's a short answer and move on. Uh, the example I'll give you specifically is the one about, you know, the person who struggles with doing the roles. And you, you not only gave the answer, but you explained how your own double roles are not necessarily as clean as you'd yeah. like them to be, but you're practicing. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that. That's, 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 that's really cool. I try to treat everybody's question, no matter how silly it may even seem to me, and show them the respect. They, they had the respect to ask the question. They had the nerve to ask it. And I'm going to try to answer it. There's two sides to everything. Yeah. And you've got to basically tell them how to get to the middle of it to figure it out. Because I could tell you how to play a role and say your hands have to be, you know, molar grip and blah, blah, blah. And I can go down that route and say that to you, but I don't really practice that. It's, that's not really the truth. <laughs> yeah. So you have to find what works. And what I learned in college, that I studied under a guy named Nick Serrato, who was a pit drummer in Broadway. And he was a conductor and he was a percussionist and a drum set player. And Nick was about music and he taught me music. And he said, in teaching me music, he taught me life. He said, this is not just about the music you're gonna play with this. It's about learning how to play with others in life because that's what a band is. It's playing with others in life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't know if you, how many bands you've been in, but every band I've been in, it's got their little quirks to it. Yeah. There's always one who wants to be out front and has got the ego of, of this. And the other guy just wants to hear it this way. And then there's the bass player who doesn't give a crud about anything, you know, like take a nap or something, you know, you know, and then you're there trying to negotiate, navigate that, you know, yeah. and it's, it's like, what am I really bringing? Why do I get gigs? Well, the reason I got gigs is I wouldn't get in the middle of the fray. I would kind of na navigate the middle and do my job. Yeah. That's what my YouTube channel is about is just me sharing who I am with people and helping to inspire them to be good drummers. Um, do you have uh, any songs you absolutely can't stand playing as a result of being in bands? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mar Margaritaville probably, you know? Oh, God. <laughs> that song's awful. Yeah, I mean, that's probably one I could never, you know, Brown Eyed Girl. That know, is on the top of my list. Yeah, Brown Eyed Girl's another one. Uh, Mustang Sally, you know. <laughs> you're, you're, going, yeah. you're going through the best of the best of the songs I can't stand play. Every good, every working musician that's had to play these got gigs knows they don't want to play them. <laughs> and I was like, I don't, I don't want to play Wipeout. Please don't ask me to play Wipeout. Yeah. I can, I can literally sleep through Brown Eyed Girl. I could play it for you if you wanted me to, but I could totally sleep through it. Yeah, it's that way. That's the, that's the song. It's just, it, it's a great song, and it, got, it made a lot of money off it. How many, how many bands have you actually been in? I've played with a lot of different bands. And, like, being a ringer, 
means like when I was doing the club day thing, I had my own band, but I would play with other people's bands. Right. And I, I've probably played with hundreds of bands, but anybody famous, not really, you know, nothing, nothing. I mean, I, I, I worked with a guy and again, I was the backup. I was the backup drummer. I'm, most of the times I'm hired to work for somebody else, you know, do stuff. This was a guy that played in LA in the sixties with the wrecking crew guy that I was talking about Hal Blaine. If you read the Hal Blaine book, his name is mentioned in it. It's a guy named Mike Dacey. He's also in a, in a Netflix video about the um, amazing bongo band that had that song with the loop that they steal for all kinds of rap records. My friend Mike Dacey's in the movie because they talked to him about how they cut that track and why they cut the track in Vancouver. There was a reason why they cut it in Vancouver. And they brought up they brought Jim Gordon, the famous session drummer from L L LA, and Mike Dacey. I used to go out and tour with Mike Dacey. You know, when I think of bands, it's hard for me to say I've been in like this band, that band, this band, that band, but I've probably been in 10 or 15 bands that I would say I was actually the member of the band. Is there any crazy band stories? People. I remember going to this one wedding. I was subbing for a guy. It was a keyboard player and um, a guitar player. Keyboard player played key, left hand bass. We got to the break and they wanted to go out and snort coke. And they said, hey man, you want to come out with us? And I'm like, no, nah, no thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay, man. They went out and they got lost and the break was over. And the Mater D's looking for the band, and I'm sitting in my drum chair, you know, getting ready to play. I'm ready to play. There are nowhere to come. They go, where are the other two guys? I said, I don't know. I don't know where they're at. <laughs> so burnt. It wasn't even funny. I did my first country, my very first country. I, I, I get a phone call from this guy at the music store. He calls me up and says, listen, I can't do the gig tonight. It's two hours before. He says, can you go down and play my gig? It pays 40 bucks. I said, okay, it's in town. You know, it was like 10 minutes from my house. While I'm setting up, the guy who's running the band says, hey, do you want a beer? Now, I've never been a big beer drinker ever in my life. But to be polite, I said, sure. Got me one beer. As the night went on, the lights went from bright to the last set we were in the dark. And I remember dropping my stick. And I had to pick my stick up. And I had to turn the light on, which was behind me. And I turned the light on. And he freaked out on me, like, turn that light off. Because he was so wasted. He was out there, bonzo wasted. We get to the end of the night, and he, I get ready to get paid. I see he hands me the money. He gives me 35 bucks. I said, what's this? He goes, you had two beers. I said, I had one beer. <laughs> Charge me five bucks for one beer. He goes, you had two beers, man. I, I'm, I'm trying. All right. Okay. He goes, hey, hey, man, you sounded great. Do you want to come back tomorrow? I said, no. What do you want people who view your videos to see your channel as? I want people to see that I'm having fun, number one. And I want people to see me as a resource if they have a question or something they want to something they want to know about the business or music. Because I, I feel like I'm not done sharing that with people. I think the problem with young people is they're not as inquisitive about that today. Mm -hmm. Because the world is very small. We now look at the world as views, endorsements, being an influencer, and that's like a job now. But I didn't do that. for. I got into music to play music with musicians and make good music that I love making. Love making. Mm -hmm. And I love the creative process of being a musician. I'm an artist. Life is going to change a little bit this year. I'm, I'm going to try to pare things back, you know, um, a little bit. Not post every day and... I already, I already cut back on my live stream. I, my live stream was really starting to take off in August. And I was feel, realizing I had this pressure now to do a live stream at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. It's like, why did I put that on me? I just, I don't need that pressure. There's more to life than that, you know. But I do want to do live streams. I do want to meet with other drummers. And I want to promote other drummers too. So maybe if I do a live stream, I'll bring you on. That'd be fun. I'd be happy to join. And I promise to be on my best behavior and not call I, you Eric. That's good. Please. <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing is it, it came up with Barry and it came up with Dan before that is Dan said that he found this. He didn't know where it was coming from, this pressure to put out videos like once a week. He was like, why? Like, I'm not monetizing it. Like, I don't, no, nobody's making me do this. It's not my job. But like, 
this this you know feeling that you have to put it out. And then Barry and I were talking about you know this is this is what I do for fun. And then I have so many other hobbies that this is just one more thing that I'm throwing in, and the mixing is another one. So for me, this is an outlet. This is my outlet of expression of music. You know, mm -hmm. Other than church or working on and and working on somebody's that I played on some albums this year, some people's projects, things that got released on Spotify in the last month. I'm on a couple guys' stuff. So this is a creative outlet for me. That's why I do it. But I know, I do know that that self pressure you're talking about is unreal and it shouldn't be there. And <laughs> that's what I tell me to not do. Yeah. Because to myself. Yeah. And I had a couple of people said, where's the live stream? You know, we miss it. It's like, I need a break. Yeah. I need a break. <laughs> and they about drum covers. Yeah, I know. Because drum covers are easy. It's fun. I do what I want. I let them go when I want to let them go. And I've got 20 in the can anyhow. They're just sitting to be released someday. Yeah. You know? So it's not a big deal to me. But getting a live stream or doing Ask Girl is a big deal. I have to really think about it. You know, so I ask girls once a month. I'm going to try to do one live stream a month at some point. And if it doesn't take traction, I won't. And I want to do live streams with people. I don't want to just go on and have people ask me questions through the chat. I hate that. Yeah. I like having people. So if you ever watched any of my hanging with the hammers, when I have people on, I, it's like this. It's like we're talking, having a good time. What is Earl's sage-like wisdom for a new and upcoming drummer in order of importance? The, the main thing for a YouTube drummer coming up, up and coming, is first off, show your passion on what you're doing, number one. Number two is don't spend a lot of money to get in it if you're not really in it. And you, you find what your passion is in the music. Is it the editing side? Some guys really enjoy the editing. Is it the sound side? Some guys enjoy learning the sound and the audio side of it. Um, some are using this as an opportunity and platform to go further with their career outside of YouTube, which that's cool. This is a great promotional platform. So I would really ask like, what, you, what are your goals? What you think you wanna do? If you just wanna play drum covers and watch yourself playing drum covers, do the best you possibly can with it, have fun with it. But the main thing is have fun. That's, that's really the biggest thing to me is I love playing. I feel like I was drawn to playing drums. And that's why you let it show in what you do. I took a drum lesson from John J.R. Robbins, the famous studio drummer who played on Michael Jackson's uh, um, Can't Stop Do You Get Enough, Taka Khan and Rufus. And he's played on a bazillion records. He's a great drummer. And he basically was asking, does anybody want to take lessons with him? So I wrote him. I said, hey, I'm interested. How much does it cost? And then I gulped. If he told me. <laughs> so prior to taking a lesson, I sent him five videos I played that were songs that he played. That took some balls, right? You know, mm -hmm. I'm sending him songs that like Stevie Winwood tune, you know, back in the high life again, and some obscure Brothers Johnson song that he played on, and a uh, Russ Freeman from the Rippingtons and David Benoit album, crazy jazz stuff that I'm not really that great at, but I thought I loved the song and I tried it. I sent him these five songs. And when we got into the lesson, he goes, you know, I watched your videos. So I got, so I think I can help you on a couple things. And he started pointing out some stuff to me. And the first thing he said, though, to me, he goes, he goes, how did you get those, how did you get the drums off those tracks? <laughs> and I said to him, I said, well, I have this program called Extract Stems. It's like, you know, you just download it. And you, he goes, what would it cost me to get you to do some of my, my famous songs like Lionel Richie's All Night Long and. You know, can, can you take the drums off them and, and put a click on it for me? I said, yeah, I think I could do that. Because what would it cost me? I said, um, how about you just do another lesson with me and you we do it on camera. And I'll, I'll talk to you about drums and talk to you about your career. And he agreed. So the second lesson I got with him was the one on I actually put on my YouTube channel. It was a lot of fun. That's you know? cool. Tell me uh, some of your favorite YouTube drummers. Like, I know Ash. Like, Drumman 190 definitely brought me into the community five years ago. Drumman goes out of his way to, to meet a lot of drummers. He's been, and drum covers by Bill, those two guys. But the guys that I grew up in the, the community with were guys like Beats by Jay, 
uh, Little Drummer Channel, Jeff Holden, who now has become the music room. Those are friends. They're, they're friends, longtime friends on YouTube. And some of the newer guys, I, I like this kid, Tate Berkey, who plays Chicago covers and Steely Dan. He's a great musician. He's going to be a great musician. If he sticks it out and makes a career of it, I think he will be 20 years from now one of those guys because he's, he's got the ability. But I, I have so many friends, like Rich Raw Dog has been a friend for years, you know, I'm friends with him. Um, Eric from the Drum Addict, a friend of mine, you know. Um, I just talked to Eric today on the phone. Um, you know, so there, there's guys like that that I really enjoy. And I, I, I always enjoy finding new guys, you know, the guys that are players. I love watching guys that are players that really like Trey B. Um, look, man, I had an absolute blast. I, I bet you I could probably do a part two, and I may actually circle back for a part two because there, there's, there's seriously, there's, there's another 12, 15 questions I could have asked or threads we could have went down that I would have thoroughly enjoyed having. Um, so, so, and so you, you made it easy and hopefully you got to know me a little bit and I appreciate you taking the time to do that. You got a little bit of my background and what I do. And so I had fun. There was so much I missed though. But either way, um, I appreciate everyone watching under the covers. Uh, again, you'll find videos and links to everything we discussed. Um, and, and it was really great having you all. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Chris. Appreciate it.